Welcome to today's program, Strategies for Designing a System for Survivorship Care, brought to you by the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. My name is Eric, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. I want to absolutely apologize for the confusion in the login process today. For any other technical assistance, please send an email to canceradvocacy at compartners.com or send a message in the chat box. Today's program is scheduled for 90 minutes and includes a question and answer segment. Please note that today's session is being recorded and all participant lines will be muted during the session. If you need assistance at any time during the program, please select star zero and the operator will help you. During our designated Q&A break at the end of the discussion, you may ask a question by typing your question into the chat box area located on the lower left corner of your screen. These instructions will be repeated later in the program. To interact with the presenters, you may submit a question at any time. Your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. If you look to the left of your screen, you will notice the links area where you will find resources related to today's program. If you would like a copy of the presentation, click on Slide Presentation to open and print a copy of the slides. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Shelley Fulnasso, CEO of NCCF. Shelley, welcome to the program. Please begin. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, I'm sorry for the uh, glitch around the, the registration, but we see a lot of people logged in, so we're really happy that you found your way here. Um, so I'm really happy that you could join us for the webinar today. First, I'm just going to spend a, a minute talking a little bit about NCCF and then turn it over to our our guest presenter. So at NCCS, our mission is to advocate for quality cancer care for all people touched by cancer. And we're a patient-centered, patient-focused organization advocating for access to the best possible cancer care for all people with cancer. We represent the interests of cancer patients to Congress, at the federal government, payers, policymakers, and others whose work affects people with cancer. And one of our key public policy priorities is to ensure that every cancer patient has access to cancer care planning and coordination services. Today's webinar is part of NCCS's new Cancer Policy Advocate Training, or CPAT, program. CPAT includes a series of educational events in, or in efforts to prepare advocates to be fully engaged in cancer care policy initiatives now and in the future. This year's program includes three webinars, and today is the second one, and an in-person training, which will take place in Washington, D.C., June 25th and 26th. Unfortunately, due to space limitations, we are not able to open the in-person training to everyone on today's webinar. However, we do have a few slots open. If you're interested in attending, you can contact Kelsey, whose email is listed on this slide. The 2015 Can Cancer Policy Advocate Training will focus on the needs of cancer survivors from diagnosis to treatment and through long-term survivorship care, and will consider policy activities that might foster or support reforms to make the cancer care system more responsive to survivors' needs. You can join the conversation today on Twitter at um, hashtag CPAT15, and you can also follow us on Twitter. Our handle is Cancer Advocacy. So we're pleased and honored to have Dr. Smitha Bhatia as today's featured presenter. She's a distinguished pediatric oncologist with a strong interest in cancer outcomes across all diagnoses and all age groups. In January of this year, she joined the University of Alabama at Birmingham to tackle the health challenges cancer survivors face during and after treatment. As a professor in the UAB Department of Pediatrics, she will hold new positions as the director of the Institute for Cancer Outcomes and Survivorship in the UAB School of Medicine, vice chair for outcomes in the Department of Pediatrics, and associate director for cancer outcomes research at the UAB Comprehensive Cancer Center. She will also join the Children's of Alabama medical staff and be the co-director of the Center for Outcomes and Effectiveness Research and Education. If you have questions, you can do a Yes, okay, you can um, type your question in the chat box located in the lower left of your screen. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bhatia. Good afternoon, everybody. Can, um, I'm going to be starting now and giving you a brief overview on a topic which is very dear to my heart, um, primarily related to cancer survivorship. And the most important thing is cancer survivorship care. And so this topic today um, is devoted to 
um, strategies for designing a system for survivorship care. So the first question that comes up is, why cancer survivorship? And we have to remember that a generation ago, less than half of those diagnosed with cancer survived more than five years. Treatment was less precise and more disabling. And cancer was a topic that was shrouded in social silence. However, now there has been a tremendous increase in the estimated number of cancer survivors in the United States, such that if you see um, in 2014, there are 14 million cancer survivors uh, with an increase in survivor population, which constitutes 1.5% of the United States population um, in 1971 to 4% now in 2014. What's important to note also is that um, about two-thirds of our cancer survivors are five-plus-year cancer survivors. What this means is that they are fairly far along from their cancer diagnosis, and this includes both men and women, um, although more women who are more than 25-plus-year survivors. But nonetheless, two-thirds of our survivors are five-plus-year cancer survivors. If you look at the cancer survivorship landscape by diagnosis, this includes a quarter of the patients who are breast cancer survivors, about one-fifth of the population is prostate cancer, 10% are colorectal cancer survivors, and then GYN cancer survivors. And then the others include GU cancer, genitourinary cancers such as prostate and kidney cancers, um, hematological malignancies such as lymphomas and leukemias and myelomas, and then a variety of other cancer diagnoses. But the important takeaway message here is that 50% of our cancer survivors consist of breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. Um, important to note also is what does the cancer survivorship population look like by their current age? And here we are talking about the young ones, which are less than 20 years of age, um, at their current age as cancer survivors, and that's only 1% of the population. And then you have 20 to 39 years, which is 4% of the population, 40 to 64 years, which is 35% of the population, 65 to 69 years, which is 13% of the population, 70 to 79 years, which is 25% of the population, but then a very large number, a fifth of the patient's population, which is 80 plus years. But in, again, an important fact to note is that 65 plus years of age is the current age for cancer survivors that include more than 55, more than 50% of our cancer survivors. Shown in another way here in this graph is the estimated number of persons with a history of cancer. And these patients were diagnosed between 1971 and 2008. On the y-axis are the number of survivors in millions. On the x-axis is the number by the year. So what is important to note here is that if you look at the green area, shaded area, those are the survivors who are less than 65 years of age. And what you see is that that number stays steady, about 6 million. But what's important to note is that 65 plus year survivors, the numbers have grown from 6 to 14, which is 8 million, to now when we are in 2020, which is 6 million, to close to 16 million, which is um, a, a tremendous increase in number. So this graph shows, what this graph shows is that the elderly population, the number of survivors in the elderly population is growing. So cancer survivorship. Dr. Julia Rowland, who is the director of the National Cancer Institute um, Office of uh, Cancer Survivorship, has stated it very nicely. She says, being cancer-free is not the same as being free of cancer. And this is an important message. So what is cancer survivorship? It's defined in a variety of ways. It's defined by the person who's affected, that is the patient or the family members or friends or caregivers. And it's defined by time frame. The day of diagnosis, the day the patient gets diagnosed, he becomes a survivor or she becomes a survivor. 
the end of treatment. When they complete their therapeutic uh, regimens, they become survivors. Or five years from diagnosis, when they're done with the most acute care part of their care for their uh, active treatment of cancer, they become cancer survivors. So different people have used different ways of describing a cancer survivor. But we have to remember that there is a cancer continuum. And although it's a distinct phase of life of cancer care, um, it still means that it starts from the day of diagnosis and it continues for the rest of your life. And there are issues that need to be handled, and these include psychosocial coping, surveillance, long-term follow-up, management of all the complications that result as a result of treatment of the cancer, and then health promotion. So there are challenges that come up in the cancer survivorship phase, and there are issues related to addressing those challenges. Um, this was very aptly put together in an in Institutes of Medicine report, um, which stated from cancer patient to cancer survivor lost in transition. And this is what they said, that cancer survivorship is a transition from active treatment to post-treatment care, and this is critical for long-term health. That there are lasting effects of cancer ex experience, and these require long-term follow-up. And that survivorship care requires planning and coordination. And that health promotion is very important uh, as a component of the long-term care. In another report called the Cancer Care for the Whole Patient, Meeting Psychosocial Health Needs, the recommendations were that we need for provision of appropriate psychosocial health services to address the information needs of the survivors, coping, health-related behaviors, identification of resources, and disruption in work, school, and family life. And then finally, and least, not the least important of all, financial issues. So let me give you a very brief history of late effects, as we call them, or long-term complications in cancer survivors. Prior to the 1970s, the diagnosis of cancer and the concept of long-term survival were almost mutually exclusive, and I alluded to that in the beginning. Um, but then as progress was made in cancer treatment, especially in the pediatric oncology population, a cohort of pediatric cancer survivors began to emerge. But unfortunately, what we realized was that late effects of cancer treatments were evident in many of these cancer survivors. And this resulted in an emerging reality that cure comes at a cost. So childhood cancer survivors, let's talk about them. 80% of all children diagnosed with cancer are cured, 80% of these. By 2020, there will be over 500,000 childhood cancer survivors in the United States. And this is what their breakdown in terms of their current age looks like. About a third of them are less than 20 years of age. These are the young ones. About 50% of them are between 20 and 40 years of age, and I'd call them middle-aged. And then about 20% of them are what we would call, call elderly in pediatric speak. And I say that um, ha only half-jokingly because what we have shown and others have shown is that once a child gets treated for cancer with the intense treatment that we offer them, that there is accelerated aging such that a 20 to 39-year-old truly behaves like a 40 to 60-year-old and a 40 to plus-year-old truly behaves like a person who's in their 60s or 70s. So what are the long-term consequences in cancer survivors. These in the pediatric age group involve growth and development. These include linear growth, the maturation of the skeleton, the intellectual functioning, the emotional and social maturation, and then sexual development. These also include, in all age groups, what we call vital organ function. So this includes impact on the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the endocrine system, 
the gastrointestinal system, and then vision and hearing. Treatment also involves fertility and reproduction. So there is a significant impact on fertility, and then there's definitely a concern about the health of the offsprings. And finally, perhaps the most devastating of all of these complications is the development of brand new cancers, both benign and malignant, directly as a result of the treatment that we gave for the first cancer. And then the impact of all of these on the health-related quality of life, on the health status, on the healthcare utilization, and then premature deaths amongst our cancer survivors. So I'm going to walk through some of the consequences of cancer treatment and then bring, back, bring ourselves back to um, the models of care. So here we are talking about what we call cognitive dysfunction or chemo brain. And normally it's usually seen one to two years after radiation to the brain. It is progressive. <clears throat> In schools, the children suffer from academic difficulties, especially in reading, language, mathematics. There are significant drops in their IQ scores. And who are the populations that are most affected? These are children with leukemia and brain tumors. These are children who have received radiation to the brain. And then there is issues related to intrathecal chemotherapy. And then the young ones, the really young ones, less than five years of age at the time of radiation to the brain, are the ones who are really affected. And then for some reason, women are, or girls are more affected than boys. So here's a large study that was done which looked at special education services amongst our cancer survivors. And there's over 10,000 individuals who were surveyed. And what they showed was that if you looked at all cancer survivors, a quarter of them said that they needed special education services. When you looked at leukemia survivors, a third of them needed special education services. Brain tumor survivors, 70% of them needed special education services. And this is in comparison to less than 10% of their siblings. So a significantly large number of our cancer survivors are needing special education services. Here's a chest X-ray of, of a patient who has a heart which is significantly enlarged and has, shows a lot of congestion. So all these fluffy shadows that you see indicate that there is a significant amount of fluid which is collecting because the heart is not able to pump out blood. This is the direct result of what we call heart failure. And this happens in our cancer survivors. It can happen spontaneously, or it can co coincide with exertion, or actually at the time of labor. One particular agent, chemotherapeutic agent called anthracyclines, or doxorubicin or donomycin, are particularly um, notorious in terms of causing heart failure. Radiation to the chest increases the risk. Girls are at a higher risk, and younger age at exposure to these agents increases the risk. Here is a chest X-ray of somebody who has a very narrow heart, flattened out diaphragm, and almost black-looking lungs, showing that there's a lot of trapping of air that's going on. This shows that the lungs are scarred. Usually, the causes for um, lung complications are radiation and chemotherapy. The symptoms are usually in the form of chronic cough and shortness of breath. And how do you prevent this from happening? Prevention is by cautioning patients about smoking and then doing frequent checks. Eventually, the only therapeutic option is lung transplant. And then, as I had mentioned earlier, Another issue that we face with is what are called second primary cancers or brand new cancers. And in this slide, what I show you is a tumor developing in the brain, a direct result of radiation to the brain. These are blasts in the blood cells, again, the direct result of chemotherapy. A lung mass, lung cancer, directly the result of smoking and radiation to the chest. 
and then a breast tumor, again, the result of radiation to the chest. So radiation is the biggest culprit. Chemotherapy increases the risk. Smoking doesn't help. Poor diet and poor exercise doesn't help. And then finally, genetic susceptibility is increasingly being recognized as playing a role. So here what I show you is the results of a study which led for, to changes in how we treat our young girls with lymphoma. So what we described here is uh, the risk of developing breast cancer amongst survivors of another tumor called Hodgkin lymphoma, and this was the direct result of radiation to the chest. And what we found was that by the time these girls were 45 years of age, one in five developed a breast cancer. And this is a very young age to develop a breast cancer. And what we also found was that um, 20, the risk of developing this breast cancer was 20 to 55-fold higher as compared to the general population. So then let's go on to what do these outcomes result in premature death. And yes, indeed, they do. So what we're showing out here is what's called a survival curve or the probability of surviving for up to 35 years for the U.S. female and U.S. male. And here is the probability of surviving for a female cancer survivor and a male cancer survivor. Each of these steps represents a death along the way. And what are the causes? The causes are recurrence, which is the old cancer coming back, new cancer is developing, and then impact on the heart and lung, causing problems there. So then, having shown you all of, these, um, all of this data, the question comes up, what is the burden of morbidity in survivors of cancer? The burden of morbidity is in the form of a destroyed hip joint because of the steroids that we needed to use in this child. Um, it's called osteonecrosis. It required us to replace the hips both the hips um, by the time this child was 16 years of age. Um, and as I mentioned, steroids and radiation increase the risk. Growth impairment after radiation. So here is the radiation field for somebody who has lymphoma and is getting radiation. And this is what happens when you receive radiation. Um, quite often in the growing child, you have what's called a pigeon chest and then scoliosis at the back. And this I had shown to you earlier, lung tumors, breast cancer, brain tumors, and then leukemia, the direct result of radiation and chemotherapy. I talked to you about cardiac complications or heart failure as a result of anthracycline chemotherapy and chest radiation. And then I talked to you about pulmonary dysfunction or chest um, lung scarring as a result of radiation and chemotherapy. So this slide, I'll show you what is the cumulative burden of chronic diseases in childhood cancer survivors. And what it shows is that if you look at any chronic health condition in a childhood cancer survivor, by the time they are 30 years out from diagnosis, it approaches 75%. So 75% of the children will have some long-lasting chronic health condition which needs, necessitates that they go to the doctor and see the doctor often um, by the time they're 30 years from diagnosis. But even more sobering is the fact that by the time these children are 30 years out of diagnosis, about 30% of them will have what's called severe or life-threatening chronic health condition. So the implications of cure are truly not trivial. The burden of morbidity in the survivors of our childhood cancer is substantial. So what are the implications? There's a need for continuing follow-up of childhood cancer survivors into adulthood. We know that the survivors and the healthcare provide providers need to be aware of who is at risk for these complications. And then only 35% of our survivors understand that serious health problems could result from past treatment. 
and this impairs the survivor's ability to seek and receive appropriate long-term follow-up care. Here is a slide which shows quite clearly that um, if you follow the children out long-term, up to 25 years out, what you find is that about 90% of them are receiving general medical contact. About 72% of them are getting a general physical examination. About 42% of them have some kind of a cancer-related visit, but only 19% of them are coming to their primary oncologist or cancer center to get the care. So the care is being provided primarily by the general practitioner or family physician here. The primary care providers, however, are unfamiliar with the problems faced by the childhood cancer survivors. And there is therefore a need for extended and standardized follow-up of our survivors. But who should provide that care? Should it be the primary oncologist? Should it be the primary health care provider? Or should it be both? The next question is, there's issues related to transitioning of care. So if a child is a child while they have cancer, and the moment they become 21, a children's hospital can't see them, do we need to transition them to an adult-centered care? If a pediatric oncologist or a medical oncologist is seeing a cancer patient, do we need to transition them into a primary care setting? And then issues related to lack of insurance. And finally, issues related to the lack of awareness regarding these late effects, both amongst the survivors as well as amongst the healthcare providers, thus preventing really good care of our survivors. <clears throat> and for this reason, for the children, childhood cancer survivors, we've developed what's called the long-term follow-up guidelines. And these guidelines are available at this URL, www.survivorshipguidelines.org. They can be downloaded by anybody. But what they do is they provide a really good roadmap of if you received this treatment at this age, then these are the things that you need to do in order to prevent long-term complications from happening or detecting them early. Long-term survival now is an expected outcome for most children with cancer. This is um, three-year-old Kelly, who um, is my patient. Um, she came to me on Christmas Eve, um, very sick with acute leukemia. Um, she did beautifully after completion of treatment and is now a high school student. Um, so long-term survival is indeed an expected outcome for most children with cancer. But what we have to remember is that we need to have the appropriate infrastructure for long-term specialized care for our survivors. We need to have um, what are called survivorship programs. And out here, I will show you an example of a childhood cancer survivorship program that I had established at, uh, in California, and I'm establishing here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And these survivorship programs can be actually applied to other adult onset cancers as well because we did so for breast cancer and prostate cancer at City of Hope. Um, so in this childhood cancer survivorship program, I would take children who were diagnosed with cancer at age 21 or younger in remission and off treatment for at least two years, and I would place them in an IRB-approved protocol. I would consent them to participate in this, and the reason for that is that I would want to learn from the experience of all the children that I take care of and my team takes care of so that we can apply this knowledge towards the future generation of patients. I would not have an upper age limit. At City of Hope, my oldest childhood cancer survivor was 61 years of age when I left. The first thing that we have to do when we start seeing patients is to delve into their medical records. And this is the medical record of a single patient. Um, it's higher than the computer it's placed against. You can see that. Um, I would go through all the pages of this medical record and create this therapeutic summary. What this does is it tells you what treatment regimen the patient was placed on, 
what was the diagnosis, um, and uh, what are the treatments that they got. These are the names of the drugs. This is how they got it, whether they got it intravenously or by mouth or um, intramuscularly, and the doses that they received, and then whether they got radiation or not. So this is the heart of the beginning and the end of all um, treatment, um, of post-treatment survivorship care. Now we take this therapeutic summary and we go into our survivorship guidelines in order to decide what um, follow-up these patients need. In addition, we've developed lay education material for our cancer survivors, um, and it's tailored to the needs of our cancer survivors. So here is a, a health link that we would give to a cancer survivor who's at risk for developing cardiac complications, and this is called Keeping Your Heart Healthy After Treatment for Childhood Cancer. We would also summarize all the results. We would call them the lay recommendations, and we would place them as bullets, again tailored to the needs of the patients, and these could be very easily stuck to the refrigerator so there's no need to forget these um, and no risk to forget these um, by the cancer survivors. We would then provide a follow-up report to our childhood cancer survivor describing all the tests that were done and the results. We would also send a similar report to the primary care practitioner, um, and this would then be taken up by them to see exactly what the, treat the treatments the patient received, the tests that we did, and what were the results of those tests. So this is my summary slide. What I want to show is that at the end of treatment for any cancer patient, there is an absolute mandate, there is now with the care plans coming in, that we summarize all the treatment that they've received, and then we provide specialized long-term follow-up for life um, using established standardized guidelines for our cancer survivors. And at this point, I would um, end my presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. So since we have a little bit of time before you have to get off, um, I would, Eric, can you please tell people how they can ask a question? Um, and I actually, well, um, after you do that, we, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask while we give folks a chance to, to let us know if they have any questions. But first I'll let you explain how to ask a question. Absolutely. If you would like to ask a question, just simply type your question into the chat box area located on the lower left corner of your screen. Once you have entered your question, be sure to click on the Send button located next to the box. Your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. Great, thank you. So can you, Dr. Bhatia, can you please ex tell us a little bit more about the gender differences? Um, I had not heard that before and I was very interested in, in uh, what we know about why that might be the case. Right, Shelley. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we don't have a clear handle on why um, girls are at higher risk of certain complications. Indeed, they are at a higher risk of a variety of complications. So let me tell you, neurocognitive outcomes as in chemo brain, um, lung complications, heart complications, um, and certain um, you know, endocrine complications. Um, my sense is, um, and we need to prove this still, that there is some... Um, amount of genetic susceptibility which plays in with the hormonal milieu, which increases the risk of these complications for our uh, female survivors. Um, we have a question from one of our participants named Catherine who asks, how do we find providers and which providers can, that can mm -hmm. and will go through such an extensive medical records, go mm -hmm. through such extensive medical records to produce a treatment summary? Right. Um, so what I want to tell you is um, that's an excellent question. The Commission on Cancer right now has come down with a mandate that uh, by the time 2019 rolls around, and they're starting it in a phased fashion, that by the time 2019 rolls around, that any patient who completes treatment during this time period needs to have a therapeutic summary created for that patient. Uh, it's a requirement. Um, now, the question comes up, what do we do about cancer survivors who were diagnosed in the past? Um, 
and how do we find providers who would do such a thing. Um, while what I described is the absolute ideal situation where you have the exact doses of treatments that the patient received, what we are also doing is developing, um, you know, a simplified version of these guidelines where uh, we can um, create a very educated guess of um, what, uh, say, a breast cancer patient diagnosed in the 1990s would most likely have received and what their risks would be and how we should surveil them or screen them in order to detect those complications early. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also interested in the fact that you um, take patients regardless of their age and that you have, mm -hmm. um, you know, older survivors of childhood cancer. Uh, because we hear often that the childhood, as the, chi the children age out and they're no longer um, kids anymore, that they have a much harder time finding care. Is that model that you have um, at your institution common, and is that being adopted by other institutions? Actually, um, that's, again, an absolutely amazing question. And, some, and I say that amazing because we're struggling with that. Um, so there are certain children's hospitals which are not allowed, the system doesn't allow them to be seen in that children's hospital beyond 21 years of age. At City of Hope, we were very lucky because we had a common system between the, the children and the adults. Acute cancer were seen in the same building, same hospital, so we could continue to follow them long term. Um, I've now come to the University of Alabama at Birmingham where there's a children's hospital, but we are right next door to the adult hospital. So when a child ages out of the system, I just have to step into the adult world and go and see the patient over there. Um, but... This is not the case in a large number of institutions. There is something called an active piece of debate and struggle and research and, um, you know, recommendations of what we are calling transition of care. And uh, what people are struggling with is as to how to do this. Um, because in the pediatric oncology model, we have, um, we mollycoddle our kids. We just you know, take every little bit of care of them and their parents and their siblings, the whole family. Um, but then they go into the adult world and the care model is a little different. Um, so what we're trying to do is to, especially in this vulnerable population, the age when they're in the 21 to 29, 30, 35, um, they're still not fully mature yet, or not in this day and age yet at least, um, where we're trying to develop what is called the adolescent and young adult um, care model. And uh, we're hoping that there will be a critical mass of uh, physicians um, in the country who will adopt these individuals and say, you are mine, I will take care of you, and I will take the care of the special needs that you have before we release you into the adult world. Great. I have another question from Samantha. It's a follow-up to the, to the first question is, could a patient research their own records to populate the form? Um, so this is um, a very good question, you know, and I had not thought of that before. But there is, I don't think anything should stop you from doing that. So this is what you would need to do. Um, you would need to um, ask for release of your medical records. Um, from your uh, treating oncologist's hospital or clinic, um, you would then have to go into those medical records and um, gather all of that information um, from the medical records to see what the treatments were that you received and summarize them. Um, is there um, a web-based web program that would allow you to do that? It hasn't been developed fully yet. We are in the process of developing it. Um, and at the end of the day, our hope is that we could um, have it so that patients would have access to their own care needs and be able to take it with them um, to wherever, whichever physician they went to and say, here, these are my records. Um, these are the things I'm at risk for and educate and advocate for their own needs. Okay. I would like to add that um, NCCS is a partner in the Journey Forward program, which um, is a software that to help create survivorship care plans and treatment summaries. And there's a companion to that. It, it's geared for practices and um, mm -hmm. physicians to be able to pull that information from the medical records into uh, a survivorship care plan. But there is a, um, a 
corollary application for it that's called My Care Plan that allows patients, if patients don't get a care plan from their physician, to create their own. Now, I don't think it would necessarily uh, help with all of the treatment summary and helping a, pa helping a patient do that, but it does help patients look at what the guidelines might be for them and create their mm -hmm. own version of a care plan if they're not getting one. So that's on mm -hmm. um, journeyforward.org. That's great. Um, I have another question from Isabel who says, do you have a subpopulation breakdown of these children? And for instance, Latino children have very different responses and after effects than mainstream children. Are their numbers higher or survivor rates? How do their survivor rates differ? Isabel, this is a question that we tried to answer and we presented the results of this at the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting last week. Um, so it's such a timely question. We were interested in taking, we took 10,000 cancer survivors and we um, broke them, stratified them by their race and ethnicity. And the question we wanted to ask was, are the complications any different by race and ethnicity? And so the good news was that overall, the burden of morbidity as well as premature mortality, there was no difference by race and ethnicity. However, there were certain types of complications which were different. So our Hispanic kids were more likely to have endocrine complications, but if you adjusted for um, you know, cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension or uh, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes, then you could take away those, um, th those, uh, those risks went away. Um, African Americans were at a higher risk for cardiovascular complications such as heart failure and coronary artery disease. And if you put in um, into the model, if you adjusted for factors like socioeconomic status and again cardiovascular risk factors, those um, higher risks also went away. So overall, um, biologically, they are uh, responding the same way and developing similar kinds of complications. It's down the road other additional factors such as um, dyslipidemia and, and hypertension and um, uh, cardiovascular and diabetes which um, change the balance of who, who gets what and, and our Latina kids and, and our um, African American kids are doing a little worse. And so that again brings up the point of making sure that we intervene effectively and aggressively in those children um, with those complications. Great. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to ask your question? Um, I have a, a third-party payment or financial question, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk a little bit about whether and what sorts of um, payment issues you might encounter. For example, I was wondering if about the um, almost senior citizen who remains in your clinic. Do you do you have like mm -hmm. out-of-network issues? Do you have obstacles mm -hmm. for getting getting kids, adults, adolescents? Um, payment for the care that you want to give them? Right. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll partition this answer into two phases. One was before Obamacare and one is after. Before Obamacare, we had major issues in terms of kids turning 21 and being taken off of what in California used to be called the, the California Ch Children's Service CCS or what is equivalent to a Medicaid here. And um, then they would be taken off of that and unless they went into a job situation where they were uh, in a good company, um, they, they faced major challenges in terms of, you know, prior health history and larger premiums and they got, you know, uh, really didn't get into a good insurance situation. Post Obamacare, the children can remain on their parents, you know that, on their parents' um, insurance till age 26. Um, there is no penalty for prior health history. Um, most of the people are buying some level of insurance. Um, and they're getting the care that they need. Now, bring this back to the situation where we have a specialized childhood cancer survivorship clinic where we're ordering tests which are state-of-the-art, cutting edge in terms of being able to detect complications early. Most of these are based on research results which are coming hot off the press. Um, very often the insurance companies balk at this. Very often the insurance companies say, we are not going to pay for this because this is not standard of care. A large amount of our time gets spent in writing appeals to these insurance companies because I wouldn't hate to be going to a parent and saying, your child is at risk for heart failure, but I can't do an echo on you because 
your insurance won't pay for this. Because of this, at City of Hope, where I was before, um, we had garnered enough philanthropic support so that we were offering free care to all our childhood cancer survivors, no matter what their insurance. Um, so the free care was in the form of a free visit once a year. It was in the form of free testing to see if they were at risk for complications um, and um, a free report. Um, they, once, if we identified any complications, so suppose we found that they had heart failure and they needed to go see a cardiologist, at that point they needed to be in a system which would take them their insurance for seeing a cardiologist. But before that, short of that, we were seeing them. So our 61-year-old was being seen in this clinic mm, yeah, free of care. But that's not a sustainable model. It isn't. So, um, so we have to educate our insurance companies, and I, I would love to have um, support from any source that I can. That we, this is they're being penny wise and pound foolish in doing what they're doing, in not allowing uh, or, or, you know, uh, refusing um, coverage for for these tests because what we are doing is we are saving them so many dollars by preventing or, or detecting these complications early. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's, um, I feel like you just gave me a lot of work to do. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have another question um, from Regina. How do you recommend training primary care clinicians for adequately caring for cancer survivors? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, first of all, I have to congratulate your audience. They are immensely educated and engaged, and I really appreciate that. So um, my dream is that all primary care practitioners would um, be absolutely educated with respect to the needs of cancer survivors. Um, For the pediatric oncology world, this is what we've done. And you should guess by now that I'm a pediatric oncologist by training. But this is what we've done for our pediatric oncology world. Um, We have tried to include the teachings in the medical school curriculum, in the residency programs, in the fellowship programs, so that they start getting learning about these things right from the get-go. We, when we see our patients in our specialized clinics, we send them out a detailed letter, which we hope will serve as a piece of education for them when they get that letter. So they understand that if a patient had Hodgkin lymphoma and received chest chest radiation, then she is at risk for breast cancer, and therefore mammograms need to be started at age 25 and continued for life. Um, So those kinds of teachings we are doing. Now, the barriers and the challenges we face are these. Um, Primary care practitioners see patients every 15 minutes. Primary care practitioners see only a handful of cancer survivors in their whole year's worth of patients. And therefore, they're not motivated or not find the time to keep up with all the nuances of specialized care that a childhood cancer survivor or even an adult cancer survivor needs. And therefore, it becomes a challenge to educate our primary care practitioners. And therefore, um, very often if you survey everybody, they all say, that the oncologist should be making the uh, coordinating the care of the survivors for life. Well, that raises other questions about workforce, though, because are there enough oncologists to do that, and do oncologists have the time to do that? Exactly. Um, so here's then yes, and so um, now this is where um, uh, that again uh, brings up the other issue. So what we are doing now. Um, because we find that our nurse practitioners are so much better at educating patients and following the protocol and making connecting with the patients and listening to them than physicians are, that they, in fact, are much better at running these survivorship clinics than the physicians. There always is a physician as a backup in case it falls outside the scope of practice for a nurse practitioner, but we have increasingly and others have um, followed a model of nurse practitioner-led survivorship clinics. 
Okay, well, we, I could ask you many more questions, but I'm going to let some of our audience members, I have a couple more from them, um, and I know you have to get off in a few minutes, but um, one, mm -hmm. another question from Catherine, one of the big holes in ongoing access to and um, knowledge of where to find, is knowledge of where to find psychosocial services. How have you been able to help ensure this for your patients? Not, we, we, I, I would say that we haven't succeeded very well. I'd almost say that we failed. So here's what it is. Um, in the specialized care model, we are able to um, have at least one social worker and a psychologist who works with us. Um, and for the pediatric population, we have this multidisciplinary team. We are very lucky to have a dietitian, a social worker, a psychologist, along with a nurse practitioner and a physician who see the patient, each patient, every time they come. We can't do that for our adult patients just because they're workforce issues. And what we've then done is developed a triage system where we have what we call a distress thermometer or we have a screening way of saying, is the patient distressed or not? And if the patient is distressed, then we ring for a psychologist or we ask for a psychologist. Um, this uh, model is not satisfactory, um, and, um, but this is what we have to offer them. Um, Long-term care in the form of psychology help and social work help, as in come back again and again for, for uh, help, um, that becomes even more challenging. The reimbursements are poor to none for these individuals. Yeah, I'm trying to, we have a, a lot more questions than we have time to get to. Um, in Actually, the yeah, of uh, maybe if, if there are additional questions, if you could write them, I could email back you the responses also. That would be wonderful. And I think um, and one of our questions was about a link to the reports that you mentioned. So if we could, we'll follow up with you and get some additional information and then send it out to all the participants um, when we um, have a, a link to the archive of the, web, of the webcast too for folks who weren't able to make it. Um, so we can send all of that out as well. Okay. Let me see if I, let me grab one more question. So this is from Liza. It says, I wonder if prime, it's, she says it's more of a thought than a question, but I wonder if primary care physicians communicate to oncologists their expectation that oncologists should coordinate survivorship care. I'm asking because I'm an almost 30-year survivor and my oncologist fired me years ago. I, that mm -hmm. is, told me to continue visiting him because of my lengthy survivorship. Mm -hmm. So this is where we need to educate our oncologists also, especially the adult oncologists because, um, as I mentioned, the pediatric world is about 20 years ahead of the adult world in terms of survivorship care. Um, I really believe that we can't discharge our patients. I believe that we need to have them followed by somebody long-term who understands the survivorship care needs of our patients. Um, how do we educate? This brings back the question of how do we educate our primary care physicians. We've tried to hold seminars. We've tried to hold conferences, and very often um, the room is filled with only five people where we wanted to have 200 people in the room. Um, it's, it's just a, a function of, um, you know, they need to see patients every 15 minutes to make their living, and they don't have the time or the energy to be able to participate in such care. So I think we, the, at the end of the day, um, we consult the fact that we need to have specialized survivorship programs, and most likely we need to have them led by nurse practitioners where we provide them with the right protocol, the right algorithm, which is fed in by new research all the time so that we can continue to meet the needs of our survivors. Okay, well, that was a perfect summary of what we need. So now let's just okay. go figure out how to make that happen. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. We have we will continue the webinar, but Dr. Bhatia had to leave for another appointment. Um, but we we are very grateful for your time and your excellent presentation. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity, and also the audience. They were just amazing in terms of their engagement. Thanks. And we'll send you the other questions. We did have some other excellent questions that we weren't able to get to, and I'm sorry for that, but okay. we will um, we'll send them to you. Okay. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Well, I, I didn't realize that um, her presentation would set us up so well for the next part of our uh, our discussion about the PACT Act, and we, we did not pay her for that, but um, we wanted to t share with you a little bit about the, some legislation that we are working on and have worked on for quite some time. For, for a decade, NCCS and Congresswoman Lois Capps have introduced, uh, have worked together on the Planning Actively for Cancer Treatment, or PACT Act. And again, in the 114th Congress, um, Congresswoman Capps and, and Congresswoman Bustani plan to introduce the legislation. It's a bipartisan effort, and it will be introduced in the coming weeks. Um, as we all know and have heard um, in our discussions with Dr. Batia, cancer diagnosis is, is life-changing, and patients have to make serious decisions and continue to make them throughout their treatment. But unfortunately, we also know that the cancer care system and the, I, the Institute of Medicine has said that the cancer care system is in crisis, that the system is not patient-centered, is not well-coordinated, and doesn't encourage evidence-based treatment decisions. These gaps in care have serious consequences for for the quality of care patients receive, as well as for the Medicare program that is responsible for more than half of the 1.6 million people diagnosed with cancer each year. So one solution to that problem is to give both patients and their providers the, the resources they need to make sure a clear plan is developed and regularly assessed from the point of diagnosis throughout cancer care and during the transition from active treatment to survivorship. Um, a thorough plan helps guide patients and their providers through treatment and beyond, and clarifies the support a patient wants and should receive. So the legislation also um, would foster care coordination. And here's a definition of care coordination that involves deliberately organizing patient care activities and sharing information among all of the participants concerned with the patient's care and also ensuring that the patient's needs and preferences are known ahead of time and communicated at the right time to the right people and used to provide the, the right kind of care to the patient. So today, most cancer patients do not receive a written care plan that explains their diagnosis, treatments, and expected symptoms. And we believe that care planning encourages these important doctor-patient discussions where shared decisions are made about how to move forward based both on medical evidence and on patients' values and preferences. Without a care plan, patients have to navigate the, the complexity of a, of a cancer diagnosis without a map for this important journey. Um, surgeries, radiation treatments, and chemotherapy all involve different healthcare providers and different facilities. It can be overwhelming, and patients need, to under need assurances that all providers involved in their care know what the other is doing. This uh, slide shows three examples of care planning templates from the American Society for Clinical Oncology. So what will the PACT Act do? The PACT Act will help uh, foster this, create a Medicare service that would ensure that patients who are on Medicare will receive a written care plan from their doctor and encourage the discussions that are necessary to ensure a, a shared decision-making process. Another question, one question that people often ask is why is it necessary to reimburse for, for this service? The process of developing treatment plans and survivorship care plans require medical decision-making of high complexity as well as significant time, and the communication of the plan to the patient also requires significant time and communication skills. As we heard from Dr. Batia, patient, physicians are very squeezed for time and do not have, always have the time that patients need for them to spend discussing their care plan and also discussing their long-term survivorship needs. So the resources for developing and communicating these treatment plans are significant, and the care planning process is more resource intensive than a typical uh, evaluation and management uh, visit. So the PACT Act would create, would reimburse physicians for creating a cancer care plan and delivering that plan to patients and coordinating care among the multiple providers. We believe the PACT Act has the potential to make cancer patients in the system that cares for them better. So why is now the time to consider a new uh, Medicare cancer care planning service? The PACT Act is consistent with ongoing efforts to improve the quality of care provided to individuals with cancer. In the Institute of Medicine report from 2013, the IOM recommended that the cancer care team should collaborate with patients to develop a care plan that reflects their patients' needs, values, and preferences 
and considers palliative care needs and psychosocial support across the cancer care continuum. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is implementing a new model of payment for cancer care, the oncology care model, which will encourage transformation of cancer care delivery. Following the IOM's recommendation, the Innovation Center requires oncology practices that participate in the oncology care model to provide care planning to all patients. In addition, there are other initiatives underway to reform the fee-for-service system, including the Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act, which repeals the sustainable growth rate formula and puts the system on a path of alternative payment models. However, it will take years for the changes to reach all Medicare beneficiaries. And we believe that implementing this new service will ensure that all beneficiaries receive care that is well-planned and coordinated, that is better for patients and for the system overall. Dr. Bhatia talked about the requirement that um, for the Commission on Cancer that patients are receive survivorship care plans. And we have seen the adoption of survivorship care plans increase, but it's certainly not to where we think it should be for patients. Um, but there really is no such requirement for patients to receive a cancer care plan up front at diagnosis and when the treatment decision is made, other than through the oncology care model, which is the new model that the Innovation Center is um, has proposed and is implementing. And we just believe that we, that seniors don't, should not have to wait until this, uh, this pilot de or demonstration program is completed to have access to this. So what you can do is when the bill is introduced in the coming weeks, we hope that you can help us in advocating for its passage by calling or writing your representative and speaking about it within your networks. Um, we, we will keep you updated as the bill is introduced, and we can provide additional information and materials. We could also use your stories to help us explain the need for a care plan or a survivorship care plan. And that is something that you can submit to us on our website, or you can email Kelsey, whose email you, um, we had in the earlier part of the uh, webinar, and we'll also, you'll also get some follow-up emails from her after this with additional materials. We've been talking to members of Congress staff over the, the, the recent months about the, this legislation. It's really important, they stressed to us that it's really important to hear from patients as to why this is necessary. So for those of you who are survivors, if you got a care, survivorship care plan and it helped you, that would be helpful for us to use. If you did not get one and, and you needed one because you didn't have uh, information about the kinds of symptoms and that you needed to look out for, the kinds of surveillance and follow-up care that you need, that would also be helpful. The same goes for a, a care plan at the beginning of treatment. We, most people we talk to say they did not receive such a thing, but um, if you did, it would be very helpful to be able to share that story. And I think under, helping, understand, helping congressmen and their staff understand why this is so challenging for patients to navigate treatment and all the different complexities of cancer treatment without a plan would be very helpful to us in making the case. So this is one way you can help us um, if this is something you think is important and you believe would, would help other patients. So I think that is all we had to say about the PACT Act, but we'd be happy to take um, any questions you might have about the legislation. Um, and if we, we can also, Eric, we can, since we have a little bit of time left, we can open the phone lines if anybody has any questions um, that they want to submit over the phone. So could you explain how to, um, Eric, the folks could ask questions by the phone? Absolutely. Uh, in addition to our web conference system, you may also ask a question through the phone if you are dialed in. To ask a question, simply select star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please note that star one will not work if you are using a speakerphone. Please pick up the handset before selecting star one. If you are waiting to ask a question and decide you no longer wish to ask that question, select star two to remove yourself from the phone queue. Again, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question through the web conference system, simply type your question into the chat area located on the lower left corner of your screen. Once you have entered your question, click on the Send button located next to the box. Your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. Shelley, you can go ahead with the Q&A. Okay. Um, I so there's one question from Samantha. Are you having a, we are having a webinar on um, June. It's not a webinar, actually, on um, June 17th. It's a, really a call just among the people who are attending the in-person training and are going to do some Hill visits ahead of time. So 
for the folks who are coming for our training July, uh, June 25th and 26th, we're going to have um, some hill visits the afternoon before, and we'll do a call just with those individuals to help brief them and prepare them. Jill, do we have any questions on the line? No, we have no questions via the phone. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, and you will get some follow-up from Kelsey after this webinar. And um, if you have additional questions that come to mind afterwards, please email Kelsey, and we will respond to you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your participation. Thank you. And with that, we will conclude today's webcast. If you take a look at the links box on the left-hand side of your screen, you will see the webcast evaluation. Please take a moment now to complete the evaluation and give us your feedback on this program. Then click on the Submit button once you have completed the evaluation to send us your responses. Your comments and suggestions are very important to us, and they help us to provide you with this kind of quality programming. Thank you for your participation in today's webcast. Today's program is copyright 2015 by the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship with all rights reserved. This concludes today's program. Thank you. You may now disconnect.